Michael Hastings. Um, Jesus said that he was going to build his church and the gates of hell would not overcome it. So if you look to your right and your left, you'll see evidence there. Um, this church is growing. There's lots of new faces. So if you're here for the first time, welcome. If you're here for the second time, welcome again. We're going to be starting off our service by looking at Psalm 100. Make a loud shout to Yahweh, all the earth. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that Yahweh, he is God. It is he who made us and not ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for Yahweh is good. His loving kindness endures forever and his faithfulness generation unto generation. So Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Your word says that all things were created through Christ Jesus for him, for his praise. And he is that good shepherd. Thank you that in these words you command us to praise you. So I pray that our attention will be fully on you this morning, that we would hear from you, and we would enjoy being your church, your future bride of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, feel free to stand or worship.
Let me just give you a little bit of a recap because uh, we took a break last week and we looked obviously at the re 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 resurrection. So this morning we're back in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had previously called all of his disciples together. Remember, he'd gathered the twelve uh, and he had charged them to be the ones who would continue his mission after he is gone. And he's going to begin teaching his disciples now to conclude, uh, to continue his mission uh, after the Lord has gone. And now this Sermon on the Mount is probably the longest sermon recorded by Jesus. It's also one of the most influential sermons in the world. Uh, you can go across the world and you can find many movements that reference some part of the Sermon on the Mount as their inspiration around the world. Even people who do not claim to be Christians do that. Uh, and that is just something to say of its uh, influence across the world. Now, primarily remember, the sermon, we looked at what it was, what it wasn't. The sermon is Jesus' correct interpretation of the law, as opposed and against the Pharisees' incorrect understanding. Jesus is speaking and concentrating on revealing the true spirit of the law. This is what we could call an exposition of true righteousness, a refutation of the Pharisees' version of righteousness. If you remember... The Pharisees had this understanding where you had to do all of their extra rules and somehow if you could keep them all, you would thus be considered righteous enough to enter the kingdom. And Jesus is here telling them that that is false. Uh, you would have to far exceed that to the point that it's impossible. And Jesus now is telling them that the way into the kingdom is conditioned upon your faith. So the sermon is about the characteristics that should accompany someone who has the life uh, of faith, who has entered by faith, into that time, into that kingdom, into salvation, and acknowledges Jesus as the messianic king. He is addressing matters of the heart here, we could say, rather than those things that are externally conformed to. It is a call to righteous living for the already saved. It is a master lesson in training in righteousness. Remember I read to you from 2 Timothy 3.16, where we are commanded through the scriptures to be trained in righteousness. 
This is a job of the Scriptures, and who better to lead us in that than the Word incarnate himself, the Lord. So let's pick up, let's read, we'll do the first two verses. We did these last time, but just by way of recap, uh, we'll, we'll move into these. So Matthew 5, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, sorry, Matthew 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth, and he began to teach them, saying, and we stopped there last time. Let me just recap the scene again. Remember, we spoke a little bit about the beauty of this scene. The Mount of Beatitudes, the northern, uh, northern shore of Galilee, up in the north of Israel there. It's beautiful, surrounded by these massive rolling hills, which the Mount of Beatitudes is one of these. You get a full panoramic view across the flat lake of the Sea of Galilee there. The skies, the morning mist, the mountains covered with wildflowers up there. It's a wonderful place if you've ever been there. Uh, usually on a trip to Israel, you'll go and stand there and you'll read the sermon uh, on the Mount, from the Mount of Beatitudes overlooking that same sea uh, that Jesus would have all those years ago. But I, I like to point out, for me, there's something very profound about this setting. It was Jesus who led them to this mountain to teach them the law. And here we have the one whose word actually spoke those things into existence, choosing this surrounding to sit down amongst his disciples and teach them what a true interpretation of the, war, of the word of God is. The word incarnate is about to explain the word of God in the very surroundings that that same word created. There is something infinitely profound about that. And remember last week, uh, the week before, we always spoke of the theological significance in these first two verses. Remember I said here that we see Jesus operating in the role of the prophet here. Remember I read from Deuteronomy, there is a prophet who was prophesied to come who would be like Moses. And Jesus here is fulfilling that role and there are allusions to Moses all through this text. That little phrase where it says, he went up on the mountain. I highlighted that that's a very unique phrase in Greek. It's found only three times in the Greek Old Testament uh, and it is all to do with Moses going up onto the mountain and receiving the law of God. So we have this, this subtext here of Moses and the prophet receiving the law, but now rather than the Lord coming down in fire on the mountain as he did at Sinai, we have the actual Lord incarnate himself sitting down to give the law. So we're, let's read now the whole of this first section that are called the Beatitudes. Beatitudes is, comes from the Latin word for, for blessed, and that's where it's just the name that is picked up on, but you'll, you'll see this as we go through. So let's read this first portion now. The Lord is sitting with his disciples. He's about to teach, and these is the first thing he says. So verse 3, Matthew 5, verse 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the famous Beatitudes, a very famous portion of Scripture. And here we see, and I find this fascinating, this is Jesus, it's really his first big teaching. He's done some small things up in the Galilee, but this is the first kind of long sermon that we have recorded like this in the book of Matthew particularly. And the first thing he says when he sits down is the word blessed. That is the first word that Jesus says, and I find that significant. Now, interestingly, if we dig into this word, a better translation of this word, some of your Bible translations may have this, would be happy. That is ultimately the root meaning, uh, and not in the English etymology, like where hap, kind of happen chance, and talks about luck. We're talking about the Greek and the equivalent Hebrew understandings of this term. The Greek word here, translated as blessed, but could equally be translated as happy. It is many times in the Bible. It's not just related to the kind of wishy-washy happy understanding that we have in our culture, what is being described here is something much deeper. It's speaking of an inner contentment, a condition of the soul. We might call it bliss, one that is satisfied, one that is content. Uh, the Greek writer Homer, uh, ancient Greek writer, he used this word to describe uh, a wealthy man who was satisfied with everything that he had. 
Again, in ancient Greek, we see this. Plato used it to describe a prosperous man who was satisfied. Many of the other ancient Greek writers use this to describe the ancient Greek gods in the sense that they are blessed and perfectly content in themselves. Now, of course, these are just showing you how the word is used in ancient Greek, but this is the kind of understanding that they had of this word happy, of this word blessed here, an inward contentment, satisfaction, self-sufficiency that is not related to external circumstances. That's just one part of it. However, when we look at the Hebrew underlying this, the concept gives us a little bit more of a clue of what Jesus, I believe, is getting at here. The Hebrew word that is translated as blessed has a root that means to walk righteously with joy. And that really is the key of what Jesus is explaining in the Sermon on the Mount. Walking righteously with joy. So here, really, you could say, is the secret and meaning of true happiness in this world. Now, I want you to really think about that. You see this amazing setting that we have here, the Lord of all creation about to teach his disciples the most important lessons they will need, the true interpretation of the law, the aim and goal, the means of righteous living for his saints. And what does he begin with? He begins with a lesson about how to find true happiness in this life. That is quite telling. You see, this is also a very clever uh, way because the quest for happiness is something that is almost as old as time itself in many ways. It is stretched back right to the human heart right from the beginning. In fact, if you even look around the world today, you'll see this is still a major issue. Actually, the theme of happiness is actually enshrined in over 110 constitutions for states and nations across the world today. It's been a major factor in law, in politics, and philosophy throughout human history. Of course, one of the most famous declarations, 1776, the American independence, It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are endowed by this creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's where that famous phrase comes from, the pursuit of happiness. You can also find it in the United Nations statement. They affirm that happiness is the universal goal and aspiration in the lives of human beings around the world. And this is nothing new. You could go back to 384 BC, to the time of the philosopher Aristotle, who declares that happiness stands as the ultimate goal of all human endeavours. Again, back to the present time, Article 10 of the Constitution of South Korea declares all citizens shall be assured of human worth and dignity and have the right to pursue happiness. There's there's even a a kingdom, Bhutan, a Buddhist kingdom in, in the Himalayas, they actually have something called a Gross National Happiness Index. They call it the GNH. And and as their king said, their GNH is more important than their GDP, their gross domestic product. And it's taken really seriously in that country. Again, uh, I could go on and on. There there were just so many of these. This theme is something that mankind seems to instinctively know is something that they want and they grasp for. But yet, as you dig in uh, to all of these different conceptions of happiness, these understandings of happiness, you begin to see... Many of them are really poor imitations of what our Lord is going to expound here. Generally, people associate these happiness with the world's understanding of happiness. Things like that. We'll dig into that a little bit more. Did you also know uh, in the Western world, but actually in the global, globally, there is something called the World Happiness Report. This is an annual survey that gets done every single year. It's actually a very big deal, uh, sponsored by many of the big things around the world. It's a massive deal and it rates nations according to their happiness and all the different factors that lead into it. Um, The UK does not score particularly highly, uh, you may be surprised to know. They don't ask us about the weather on that, that's not a factor, which I think it it should be if it's going to be a fair survey, but uh, joking aside, the UK is not particularly happy, and one of the interesting trends in recent years is that Western developed nations have been coming down in the happiness index. And this is, uh, again, quite telling. The 2024 report in the UK for the UK survey, under 25s are increasingly less happier than the older generation. And this is, again, something that we see happening. And when you read through the surveys, you'll figure out that all of these are linked to societal issues and external pressures. The measures are things like wealth, resources, friends, family, relationships, business, money, success. Uh, All of these play into the understanding and ratings that happiness is given in the world. Now, while some of those things, there's many blessings in some of those things, these are things that the world uses and associates with happiness. And we are sold this constantly. 
through the news, the media, through our magazines, through our social media accounts, podcasts, YouTube, Netflix, whatever it may be, we are being sold relentlessly the world's values and told to value the things that the world says we should. And thus, somehow, if we have all of those things, we will somehow find this elusive happiness that everyone seems to talk about. That is the philosophy of our day. And Jesus here is countering, actually, a similar philosophy of his day. It was primarily the Pharisaic philosophy of his day. But we are about to see Jesus completely upend the value system of the world and declare the exact opposite that is true and necessary for complete happiness. And he says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy, oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. There's no R in, uh, in the Greek there. It, it's more of a statement uh, than it is. This is the first thing that Jesus says in this great sermon, and it is really the foundation for everything that follows. We're going to see this sermon last for uh, two chapters here. But this first sentence is so important. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, true happiness is found only by entering into relationship with him, by acknowledging him as king, coming under his reign, his rule, his dominion, his authority, giving yourself over into his care for his purpose, and thus coming under his blessing too. Psalm 144 verse 15 says, How blessed, how happy are the people whose God is the Lord. You see, such a person is happy, is blessed to live in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of light. And it will manifest in the things that we see throughout this whole sermon as he explains all of these elements that, again, go against everything the world tells us should lead to happiness. It is an exact opposition of the world's value system. And thus you see why it will elicit a response from the world in the form of persecution and mockery many times. But the first step on this great journey is, through, is to be poor in spirit. So let's dig into that term a little bit here. It's quite interesting sometimes to look at how other Bible translations translate it. It gives us a different nuance. Um, poor in spirit is the, is the, the literal inter uh, translation, but the, the meaning is more the good news translation or the new living translation. They translate it like this. Those who know they are spiritually poor or those who realize their need for him. That is probably the best connotation that we have there. Those who realize their need for him. That is what it means to be poor in spirit. You see, you cannot enter this place of true happiness without first realizing that you cannot earn it. It is not a, a reward system for something that you've done. There is no pride, there is no boasting to enter the kingdom of God. It is not a success ladder that we have to climb to get to the top and then we attain entrance. This is like what the Pharisees were teaching at this time. And again, we must not look back at the Pharisees and think that, oh, how silly of them. I believe we do this all the time, don't we, in our lives? We're taught, really, from when we're young, that we have this continual expectation that we're going to climb, we're going to climb, we're going to climb, we're going to climb the ladder. You're going to get these degrees, that degree. You're going to get just this job, that job. And you've got to get up and reach the peak. It's always in an upward direction, climbing, climbing, climbing. And that is somehow the secret to happiness. Well, that is not going to do it, Jesus says here, because inevitably we are in a fallen world and things don't actually work like that. God says here, the first step to true happiness, contentment, satisfaction, joy, is to acknowledge our lack of means to reach it. And this goes against everything the world tells us. But this is a lesson for us. And it would have been a lesson for the Jews of this day too, because they placed their right, their access to the kingdom of God, remember, in their, in their lovely credentials as pious religious people. And they thought that was going to get them uh, into this place. But again... Jesus comes along and says, you've misunderstood everything completely. That is not it. Unless a person is poor in spirit, he will never taste the kingdom of God. You see, as long as they're hanging on to their own self-reliance, their self-importance, their pride and their self-sufficiency, they will not enter the kingdom of God. They will not find this sort of happiness, this inner contentment that the Lord is speaking about. This comes from the king. It is reserved for his people. Paradoxically, it may appear in this world that sometimes his people are the ones who seem to have nothing. Now, the West is kind of an anomaly over recent history. Go around the world in many places today. I, I had reports come through today of Christians who were killed in Nigeria. Again, this is happening all over the world in, in many places, uh, to the degree of thousands. This is it. They appear to have nothing, yet, through Christ, they're richer than everyone else. This is what Jesus meant. Until you are poor, you cannot be rich. This is what he meant when he said, you have to lose your life in order to save your life. 
This is the point he's getting at. Let's dig into this picture a little more. The word poor, the word itself, the Greek word is very interesting. Now, there are some who read this, and they say this is speaking about material poverty. Uh, they would sort of, and you see this through the medieval uh, history a lot of the time, it, it's more holy to be poor, is what they would say. Therefore, uh, you give away all your goods, and you, you maybe live in a commune and things like that. And people have gone on and on with these type of things. Again, that's just not really what the verse is getting at. If, you know, if the Lord calls you to that, fine. But that's not really what this verse is getting at. It is poor. This is why Matthew has that little phrase, in spirit. That is the, the, the clause that is, we need to focus on there. However, trying to gain entrance, if you, if you do take that interpretation, think about it. Trying to gain entrance to the kingdom of heaven by obeying a command to be poor is actually the exact opposite of the intent of the teaching because you are still trying to obey something in order to get rewarded with something. It's still exactly the same thing that the Pharisees were doing. No matter how pious or holy that may seem, that is not it. You're missing it, trying to gain by obeying. Of course, this is spiritual poverty that is being talked about here, but let's go a little further with the word here. It's very interesting. The word in Greek, the word that is used here, poor in spirit, comes from a word that means to crouch, to cringe, to cower. And the picture is one of cowering like a beggar. That's how it was often used in the Greek language. Shrinking away from someone to the ground. Begging. That is it. Shameful in that respect. Someone who was the lowest of the low in society. That is how this, world, this word was used. Now, what's interesting about this is this not, there was another word in Greek for poor people, speaking of physically, materially poor people, uh, and we see that used in the New Testament. Let me read to you Mark chapter 12, the famous story of the widow. Mark 12, verse 42, Jesus says, A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty, but in all, put in all she owed, all she had to live on. Uh, it's a wonderful story and teaching about uh, this woman giving all that she had to God. But the word that is used of poor there is a different word. It speaks of someone who survives on very little, but still, you notice, had something to give. Yes, she, was, she didn't have much, but she still had a widow's mite that she could give. She still had something. It's speaking of that type of poor. The word that Jesus uses for poor in spirit is much, much stronger than that. It's referring to someone living in utter destitution, abject poverty, people who have absolutely nothing to give. They're crouched and brought low, beggars. They have no means of income. They are totally dependent on the giving of others for their survival. So it's a stronger word. And that is why I believe Jesus picks this word here, because it gives us insight into the spiritual requirement for entry into the kingdom of God. It is the person who has realized that they are poor spiritually, who has realized that we don't contribute anything to salvation. If we did, we'd be boasting about it. We don't contribute anything. We are utterly dependent on him, his work, his death, his sacrifice, his resurrection, his power for our salvation, and ultimately his grace that he made it available to all of us. This puts him in a position, you see, where he is exalted above us and we are below him and we willingly bow our hearts and our lives to him. This is the picture that is being created by this word here, poor in spirit. The gospel was made for people who are poor in spirit, we could say it like that. Isaiah 61, verse 1, we've seen Jesus quote this verse already. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, and he has sent me to bind up the broken-hearted. Those words there, poor, broken-hearted, these both come from the same word. It's not referring to physically poor, materially poor. This is speaking to those people who understand that salvation comes completely from God. You cannot earn it. This is exactly the situation you see when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. If you have put your faith in the Lord as King, as Saviour, you would be poor in spirit because that very act of coming to the Lord and saying, I cannot save myself, Lord, please forgive me, I cannot pay for my own sins, but you have paid for me, is what it means to be poor in spirit, acknowledging that it is Jesus and only Jesus who can do this. He is the one who gives you a way out of that situation through his salvation on the cross. That is what happens when we come to the Lord for salvation. We see ourselves in utter desperation and need of him. 
We contribute nothing to the salvation, as is often said, except the sin that made it necessary. We don't qualify anything in ourselves for that blessing from God. We need mercy, we need grace, we need a source of blessing that has to come from outside of ourselves, and that is where God steps in. You see, he is the high and exalted one, he is the king of kings, and we are not. And this is what Jesus wanted his first lesson to be, because if you don't get this lesson, you're not going any further. Everything else you may take may just be a good ethical system, a good political system, a good thing to put into your constitution to make a nice society, whatever it may be, but you're not a saved, regenerated heart. You don't have the kingdom of God, and it'll probably end up like something like the Pharisees there. Cold, dead religion, external conformity to rules where there is no life, and that is very depressing. But Jesus here is offering him, remember, his whole point is this is the way to find true happiness, true contentment when you put yourself in the arms of the Saviour. And this is, again, we see this today, don't we? How many times have you had a conversation with people? I just don't need God, is their attitude. I just don't need God. It's very nice for you that you have this belief that gives you some sort of uh, solace in this world. If you need that to get through the world, okay, slight condescending, you know, you've had those conversations, we've all had them. That is exactly what Jesus is addressing here. You see, that person is not poor in spirit. They think they can make it on their own. They have not understood the world. This is exactly what it is. We see it all over the world today. Jesus is coming and saying, whilst you have that attitude, you will not enter the kingdom of God because you will not bow to the king. You see, those who are saved, who are poor in spirit, have submitted themselves to the king. And this is why people often have trouble doing this. They don't like this talk. I'm the kind of king of my own life. I'll rule my own life. I don't need anyone telling me what to do. And we have that kind of proud, high, exalted attitude But unfortunately, that is the attitude that is keeping us away from salvation. Yet through this, we must also see how much God loves us. Because interestingly, the very way into the kingdom is because Jesus was willing to come and do that for us. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, look at this verse. It's a very interesting verse in light of what we're talking. For you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now understand, the word poor there, that's the same word we're talking about, poor in spirit. And it's not speaking again of material poverty here. The word poor and rich is making an analogy. Jesus was rich, remember. He was rich in all things spiritually, part of the eternal Godhead in glory and honor in the throne room of God. Yet because of his love for mankind, because of his desire to bring us into his kingdom, he stepped down out of glory, became incarnate in a human frail body, lived as a frail poor man on this earth, even to the point that he suffered a shameful, humiliating execution on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago. That was his poverty. But then it also says, doesn't it, in the Bible, that because of that, God then highly exalted him to the highest place, so that his name would be above all names. And his resurrection, that is what we spoke about uh, last Sunday, actually. But because of that, all of us are also brought into glory with him. Those who become part of his body by entering into the kingdom through faith. Because he has ascended, we will ascend. Through his poverty, we will also one day be made rich in that way. We are blessed with all the spiritual blessings of heaven. This is what the Apostle Paul writes, Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing. We can't even really begin to imagine those blessings. Many of them are listed in the Bible. I believe you'll spend your whole life trying to study them all and understand them all. But this is what it means, the attitude of the poor in spirit. Jesus, again, he gives us another parable in Luke 18 that illustrates this. Let me read it to you. Luke 18 Verse uh, 9. And he also told this parable. Listen to who he tells it to. He told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. It's pretty, pretty current, isn't it? It's exactly the sort of thing. I don't need God. I'm okay on my own. Actually, I'm a pretty good person. I've never done anything wrong. Who are you to tell me that I'm a sinner? And on and on it goes. We've been around, we've seen this many times. But in all seriousness, this is exactly what the attitude that Jesus is addressing. He told this parable to some who see themselves as righteous. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee 
and the other a tax collector. So one who was considered pious, who was considered religious, who was considered to be one of the leaders and rulers of society, the other a tax collector who was considered to be a traitor, a publican, despised in society. Of course, most people hearing the story would immediately be like, Pharisees, these are the good guys, tax collectors, they are the bad guys. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, that's the exact attitude there that the word poor in spirit means. Remember, the picture of someone crouching. We see this man, he's unwilling to even look up to the heavens as he comes because he knows his spiritual poverty. Whereas the man who thinks he's got it all together, who's giving his money to charity and he's doing all these sorts of things, he can stand up and say very nice long prayers, probably has a nice house, nice living. He is the one that God says, you're far from the kingdom. Okay, you're not entering the kingdom. It is the one who acknowledges their dependence on God. That is, in fact, the one who needs God and who gets God and who enters the kingdom. You see, not even lifting his eyes, crying out to God. This, God says, is the beginning and the path to true happiness. Because the Bible does teach that in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. Walking righteously with joy, remember, is the root of that word. And when Jesus is talking here about the way to find contentment and satisfaction, the first step is to come to the Lord for salvation. Everything else is just going to be the world's interpretation of happiness. You see, we are told many things that will try and give us happiness and success. All of them are fleeting. They can change in a moment. A bad trip to the doctor and everything changes, doesn't matter. You know, you just, on and on would these go, things go. But what Jesus is telling us here is an inner contentment and a happiness and an understanding of who you are, who God is, and where you will be in the future that transcends all external circumstances, good and bad. Which is why, as he goes through this, we're going to see people who are persecuted still have happiness and joy in the Lord. And on and on it goes, because it comes from being in relationship with God. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is access to the kingdom, having that relationship with the king. Realizing that is the first step for all of his disciples. It is everything that follows in the Sermon on the Mount is predicated upon that understanding. And we would do well to remind ourselves of this. Because many of us here, if you have given your life to, to, to Christ, you understand this at the point of salvation and that your salvation is totally dependent on him. But then somehow along the way of living our lives, we often seem to forget that, don't we? And somewhere we sort of suddenly think, oh no, well, the rest of it is kind of up to me now and I am responsible to do it. And we seek our happiness in many different things. We seek it maybe in a relationship. We seek it maybe in a career. We seek it in an education or a degree or a position or whatever it may be. Jesus here is saying, no, the key to happiness is to be utterly dependent upon the Lord for everything because he is preeminent, he is the king of kings, he is the one who has planned this world and he is the one that will carry you through. No one else has defeated death, no one else has paid the penalty for your sins. It is Jesus, all about Jesus, everything is Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the result of this attitude is the kingdom of heaven, the riches of his grace, the rule of Christ in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit coming through us, the future blessings of living in that kingdom that will come, that will be established on the earth, but also right now having the fruit of the Spirit established in our hearts that are under his reign. Romans 14, 7, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. On and on and on these blessings could go in the Bible. This is where true contentment, true meaning, true purpose, true happiness and joy is to be found. It is in Christ, the one who created us. And this is part of the beginning of this scene that we see as he sits on this mountain here teaching his disciples. And as I look around, as I read these world happiness reports, I see these epidemics of hopelessness and all these different things, it cries out to us how much the world needs this message. Probably now more than ever. But this is where it starts, to be poor in spirit, to understand that it is God and all God. Isaac Watts put it so wonderfully in that hymn. He wrote a whole hymn on the Beatitudes. 
It's called Blessed Are the Humble Souls That See. Read it if you get a chance. It's wonderful. But the first beatitude, he says, Blessed are the humble souls that see their emptiness and poverty. Treasures of grace to them are given and crowns of joy laid up in heaven. And many saints have lived with that in their heart. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to take communion in a moment. I'll invite our brother up to come and lead us. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. Father, we thank you that you are the king, that you humbled yourself, you gave us that example, you came down to earth, you lived, you died for our sins, Lord, and that you rose again and defeated death. And through that, Lord, by faith in you, we can have access to your kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to strengthen our hearts in grace as we move forward, as we walk into that future. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who may not know you in that way. Lord, I'd ask that your spirit would be convicting them, speaking to their hearts right now, Lord God, that you would be drawing them to yourself, that they too would see their need for the saviour of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. wonderful reminder of the gospel we've heard this morning. Let's remind ourselves of that verse that Tommy shared from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And as we've been reminded it is through our realization, through our recognition of our utter inability to save ourselves and our utter dependence on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that we can come into relationship with him. And isn't that a reason for us to celebrate? When we realize those of us who have recognized our our complete dependence on the saving blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we realize that, we can come to this table with thanksgiving and in celebration. We are those blessed who are poor in spirit. But before we take the bread and wine, if there are those that are with us this morning that have heard that message and have not yet realized their need for Christ, not yet bowed the knee to the saviour, to the king, the servant king, who might still think, I I don't need a saviour, I'm fine. I can get through this life. Then please refrain from taking this bread and taking this wine. We're taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we need to come to this table with the right heart. We need to have humbled ourselves, we need to have recognized our need for the Savior, and then we can come with thankful hearts, and then we can come and share this meal which the Lord instituted. Let me just read from Matthew chapter 26, where we read how Jesus instituted this meal. He instituted this meal the night before he was betrayed, and it's it's great to be able to celebrate this meal together so soon after Easter when we've been reflecting so much on that week leading up to his death. And the night before, or the night that he was betrayed, it says here in Matthew 26, verse 26, and they were eating, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread He blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We're included in that. And how many over these 2,000 years since this supper was instituted, many, many have shared in this. 
And is it wonderful now to be able to join with that multitude in remembering the Lord? And why do we do this? Well, it says that his blood was shed for many for the remission of sins. And those of us who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus know that we have fallen short of God's glory. We are all in need of this new covenant for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it is by grace that we have been saved and that not of ourselves, it's the free gift of God. So we can say hallelujah, we can be thankful as we come to this table. So let's do that. And I would just say that if there's anyone that hasn't yet taken that step of faith, as I said before, do refrain and don't be ashamed to refrain, but do come and speak to one of us afterwards if you want to know more about being able to participate in this wonderful celebratory meal. Let's pray as we come to the table. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning because we've heard the truth of your word. Because those of us that know you, those of us that have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, we know you and we know what it is that you've done for us. We humble ourselves again, Lord, and we say that we need you. There's nothing that we can bring to this except the sin which makes it necessary. And so soon after celebrating the wonderful victory that you won for us on the cross, Lord Jesus, we just thank you and we praise you. We thank you for your body broken on the cross. We thank you for your blood poured out for us. For this new covenant which puts us into relationship with the Father and for the wonderful spiritual blessings that we have in the heavenly places through Christ. We give you all the glory, Lord Jesus, this morning, and we thank you for what you've done. And we remember your body broken as we take the bread. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this cup which represents the blood of the new covenant. We thank you for making a way, Lord Jesus, for us to be in communion with the Father. And we do this, Lord Jesus, in remembrance of you, looking forward to the day that you come back. Blessed be your name, Lord Jesus. Bless you all, brothers and sisters. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a blessing. Let us celebrate that together as we fellowship just now. There will be tea and coffee, I'm sure, and cakes and treats next door. But let's just enjoy our fellowship together as brothers and sisters. Let us build one another up. Let us encourage each other as we fellowship together. And let's remember the blessing that is to be called children of God. And as I said before, if the Lord's been prompting you about what Tommy shared, about what we've studied here at the table now, then come and speak to us. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. <laughs>